Welcome and thank you for joining us for Manhattan Graphic Center's second online artist talk. These events are made possible by grants from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, New York State Council on the Arts, the Pierre and Tana Matisse Foundation, and our supporters. Thank you. I'm Sarah Kirk Hanley, the Executive Director, and tonight we are delighted to welcome Mildred Beltre to speak about her work. Beltre, a native New Yorker, is an accomplished artist, professor, teaching artist, and community activist. She has exhibited her work extensively throughout the United States and abroad. Beltre works in a variety of media, techniques, and settings, with printmaking serving as the foundation of her multidisciplinary activist practice that also includes installation, sculpture, and fiber arts. Themes include identity, social justice, and gentrification. Her work is included in the special collections of the Brooklyn Museum, the Walker Art Center, and many others. She has also curated several exhibitions, served as a guest critic, and has been awarded numerous residencies at Brick, the Vermont Studio Center, NYU, and others. Beltre has taught at several institutions of higher learning as, and community arts organizations. She has been a professor at the University of Vermont for over 10 years. Beltre is also co-founder of the Brooklyn High Art Machine with Owasa DuVernay, an ongoing and constantly evolving public art project exploring community through art making on Brooklyn's sidewalks. Tonight's program will begin with Beltre sharing her work. Please feel free to submit questions throughout the talk using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We'll monitor questions and address those that require a timely response during the presentation. General or philosophical discussions will be addressed later in the program after a short conversation between Beltre and me about her work and current concerns. And now please welcome Mildred Beltre. Thanks, Sarah. I'm gonna go right to share screen, okay? Um, hi, I wanna start by thanking Sarah for inviting me to do this. Um, we had actually talked about doing this uh, live and I'm glad that we were able to transition to this format, I also want to thank Erica for helping to make this all technically possible. Uh, I'm going to start with um, some older work to give context for some of the things that I'm interested in and, and thinking about. Oh, sorry, I forgot to make it large. Okay, so um, this is a silk screen with marker. And it, um, I mean, I, I guess it addresses one of my concerns and that, that of presence. And I'll talk more about that as it goes on. So I wanted to start the talk um, with showing some work from a show I did back in 2014 at the Burlington City Arts um, called Dreamwork. And with this work, I was, revisiting, um, I guess, an interest that I have in, in revolution and revolutionary work. And I was also thinking about the role of dreaming in this kind of work. Uh, this wall shows several small drawings and some crocheted hair pieces. Those are the things in the center, the black pieces in the center. Um, and the striped drawings are all feature figures, various figures from the civil rights movement and um, beyond. So the figures are rendered in silhouette, but the titles of the pieces give um, a hint as to who's depicted in the work. The figures are rendered in silhouette because I was thinking about the idea of history and what does it mean for something to be history. It implies 
something that has happened, something that's been completed, um, something that's been fully rendered. And I guess I was trying to think about the fact that the work of these figures was not yet completed. This work, this, this was not yet in our past. Um, here's a close-up of one of the drawings. This is silk screen with um, collage paper that's been soaked in walnut ink. And that's a uh, 12 by 12. Here are some others. Um, I will, I guess I won't, I won't necessarily mention who the figures are. That can be um, a question. Another part of that exhibition, so that exhibition consisted of three walls and um, the first images I showed were from the first wall, which I called uh, dream workers. So it was sort of focusing on these actors, you know, these figures who had sort of um, started to bring this vision to life. Um, the second wall, which you're looking at here, I was trying to think about a little bit the aftermath of that kind of activity or that kind of revolutionary thought and action. And I also wanted to think about what that looks like. What does that look like between people, right? So when we think about uh, social unrest, when we think about revolution or we think about social justice, we think about something that I, I think I think we think about something that's outside, um, something that exists maybe, you know, in the street, as we're seeing like protests exist in the street, or it exists, um, you know, between, it exists through laws or something, but I wanted to think about the fact that it actually exists between people. Um, and so this wall, um, in my mind, was titled Bring the Revolution Home, and it had to do with sort of how do you consider these kinds of things within a domestic or more intimate setting? Um, so the pieces here are mostly prints um, with either some collage or drawn elements. Um, uh, mostly woodcuts uh, with some silk screen. And the imagery, there's a lot of repeated imagery and an image that I used a lot, especially at that time, is the image that you see, oh, I have those up. The image that you see here of sort of these like interlocking shapes. Um, and those interlocking shapes were sort of a way for me to think about human connection or humans relating to each other or people relating to each other. Like what's the system of relation and what kind of system could be devised? What sort of new system could I imagine or invent through the constant arranging and rearranging of these sorts of, um, these sorts of forms? And so you see it a lot throughout the work. Um, this piece here is called Drip, and I think it was about 21 inches by 21 inches. Um, here's an, Andrew, here's could you work. tell us um, the techniques that you're using in these works? Sure. You... So this one is a, it's um, two layers of woodcut with a drawing, which is the black that's a drawn with ink, and then with a collaged element, which is silk screen and uh, actually woodcut and marker. So it's using a lot of um, it's using a lot of different materials, and it's also kind of you know recycling my own work to sort of like invent and reinvent new new things. Right. So you use your matrices more than once um, in different yeah. different iterations to, to make unique works based in the matrix. Yeah, so all these all these images here, right, they use printmaking, but they're all unique images. Mm -hmm. um, the two images here, I believe the one on the right is called Core, and the one on the left is called 
goes. Um, they're both um, wood block based with, and the one on the right has drawing and also a collage element that um, has some silk screen in it too. Um, the, the one on the left, I was trying to remember how the graphite, it has its ink and it's also graphite. And I believe that the graphite was, um, I'd drawn on my block and it was transferred during the printing. Okay. We have a question about the paper you use, but I don't want us to geek out too much on technical details. Yeah, no. <laughs> <it's not. laughs> Maybe paper just is like not very mysterious. I use Reeves BFK. <laughs> it's the tried and true. It's the paper I started using as an undergrad and um, despite having been pushed by several printmakers I know to try other papers. I, <laughs> I'm a fan. <laughs> All right, um, well, back to your ideas. <laughs> this is, um, and so now we're on to the third wall that was in that exhibition. And I invite um, the people listening to check out, you can check out installation shots of the show on my website. Um, uh, this was uh, mostly marker drawing with some collage printed elements. And uh, this drawing is called Dream Flag. And it's about, it's 30, 38 by 50 um, inches, which at this point was basically the largest I'd ever worked. Um, and accompanying this drawing on the wall was uh, this cross stitch. And this exhibition was also the first time that I incorporated cross stitch into um, into a show, and I it, it came out of I, I think it came out of a desire to incorporate um, start to incorporate text into the work. Um, typically, I at this point I was working primarily in abstraction, and it, abstraction has been really important for me um, as a way of working and also as a way of working through political ideas. Um, I think abstraction has, I think abstraction of abstraction as allowing for a way to think about things that don't exist yet. And as a place also to maybe, and I, in juxtaposing the text with these abstracted pieces, I also thought about these, um, these sort of these fields of pattern as a place to contemplate these ideas that were being put forward more directly. So I was interested in that relationship um, of, of the abstraction of sort of offering a space um, for something, for the generation of something new or different. Um, and um, and this cross stitch is a borrowed quote. Um, and I was thinking about, you know, post civil rights and in sort of this like post racial world that we, you know, reportedly lived in after the election of Obama. Um, there, you know, just this idea of it, it's part that this phrase is borrowed from the post apartheid South Africa, where they were proposing a rainbow nation to sort of um, evoke this idea of inclusion. And people who were critical of, of that as sort of this like um, rhetoric that wasn't actually functioning pointed out that there's no black in a rainbow. So I was interested in that idea of, um, I guess, the failure, right? Like the failure of that kind of um, rosy evocation of um, social justice or racial harmony. Um, this is a piece that I made later um, and it's uh, linen, and wool. 
And it was sort of one of my first forays into objects. And I'm showing it here because part of what I was also thinking about with the DreamWork, um, with the DreamWork exhibition, I was thinking about both the idea of dreaming as a revolutionary act and the work that it takes to realize those kinds of dreams or any dreams really. And then I was also thinking about, you know, the dream that Martin Luther King Jr. spoke about in his um, a speech on the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. And thinking about, I guess, thinking about it in a couple of contexts, just that idea of, um, you know, what that dream was, what that dream consists of, what the work of that dream is. And then, um, you know, I, I come from an immigrant family. So there's also, I think also a little bit of this conflation for me of also the American dream, right? Like of where does that fit in? Where does the American dream that maybe lots of immigrants who come to this country are thinking about or reaching for, how does that, what relationship does that have to the dream that Martin Luther King Jr. was talking about? And you know what are the what's the relationship between those desires? Those, yeah. Um, another. This was also a later um, crocheted piece, and it's a quote from uh, Reuben Hurricane Carter, who was a boxer that was. Um, incarcerated for a long time, and on his in speaking on his his experience in prison, he said, I would not help my keepers to keep me kept. And uh, for me, this was sort of like an important way of thinking about, um, again, that thing, right, of what does, what does revolution or resistance look like on a very personal level. Um, so this piece is pretty small. It's about, I don't know, maybe five inches uh, in circumference or diameter. And um, it also, on the top and bottom and around it, it sort of has a border of hair, as well as like a little hair uh, pendant hanging from it. Um, and this was a little bit before this, I had started using my hair in my work and you can see a little bit of it here as well in the on the dreamwork dreamworker wall and that became um i guess using those kinds of materials started to become important to me as i thought more about i guess what the what what could be the relationship between myself an abstraction as a way of speaking about a particular experience. So what are what were things that I could start to, you know, throw into my work to more directly mark who the speaker is. Um, and, and I think this became more important also as I started incorporating text into the work was that it became more important for me too to like locate a speaker or locate a voice. Um, so now I'm moving forward a little bit, and this is work from 2016, I think, or 2017, 2017. And um, it sort of marked um, the beginning of more incorporation into a group uh, in, of text into my work and also working larger. So this is also 38 by 50. It's a color pencil drawing. Um, on a on a base of walnut ink that I, I made myself. Um, and so for this piece and its companion piece, um, I was thinking about I was thinking about the um, the Zora Neale Hurston essay, uh, How It Feels to Be the Colored Me, which has been, you know, a line from which has been very, been made very famous by the drawing by Glenn Ligon. Um, that reads, I feel most colored when I'm thrown up against a sharp white background. 
Um, so in the essays where Neil Hurston talks about her experience growing up in Florida in a primarily black community and the comfort and the warmth that she felt living in that community and the and then she talked about how she felt when she would leave that community, what that experience was like. And that's where the quote comes from, is that she was made to feel less than when she was thrown um, up against this sharp white background, which is how she described the experience of leaving her community. And I, I wanted to think about that idea. I wanted to think about the idea of feeling colored. And I, I was also wondering if feeling colored was a condition that you could seek out and if that condition could actually be one that brings comfort um, rather than being one that weakens. Um, and so I, so I changed the phrase and, it, and so my drawing, um, which I believe can sort of be read, like if you sort of come up on this drawing, I don't think you automatically understand that it's text. Um, I think you can appreciate it for its visual qualities um, but it's my hope that if you spend time with it, you, it suddenly starts to appear, right? Like that it'll, it will come to you. Um, and so the drawing reads, I feel most colored when I'm thrown up, when I'm thrown, when I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> I feel most colored when I'm against a warm brown. Um, and again, so I was just trying to think about you know, what, 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 what's nice about it? Like what would be, what would feel good? Um, and then I was thinking, you know, what could be, what could be the opposite of that? Like, you know, so if I'm reclaiming colored as a, as a desired, you know, as a, as a desirable feeling, what, you know, what could be a feeling that um, that would be debilitating, right? So then I, so this drawing reads, I feel most racist when I'm thrown against a sharp black. And so I was thinking about the term racist and thinking that that's, a, that's not a term that anyone wants to claim. Um, and, and so that in that way, it's, it's a debilitating term, right? Like, I mean, I, I think that's really interesting that no one claims that term, or maybe I'm wrong, maybe some people do, but I've never heard anyone do it. Um, and, and kind of wondering, wondering about that, you know? So like, you know, what would be, like, so in thinking about like, what would be the opposite of, um, of something that was desirable, like, what would be like the least desirable thing that you would want to be and what might provoke that condition. Um, so Sarah, you can let me know if I'm moving too quickly. Um, so I, okay. Um, so I want to talk, so I start to touch on the idea that, you know, I was starting to feel in my work that I needed to ground it a little more. I needed to ground it a little more in myself. So I started to do that by incorporating the hair. And then I started to do that by incorporating my own image. Um, so this is a four color, four color silk screen um, that began that sort of launched the series that I was thinking about called Skin in the Game. And skin in the game was a way to think about, you know, if I'm interested in social justice, if I'm interested in working towards a better world, if I'm interested in a revolution of sorts, what am I, what am I willing to risk? What am I willing to put at stake? You know, what's my skin in the game? Um, and so it started with this um, series of portraits and but with these portraits, I was also interested, I think still, and I think it's related to how I was thinking about the text, that I, I'm also interested in this idea of legibility. And, and I think part of that interest comes from the fact that, um, you know, as a, as a Black woman, as a, as a Afro-Latina, I am, 
uh, afflicted by like the double blights of invisibility and hyper visibility. And so I was trying to think about what that looks like, right? What does it look like to, what does it look like to be there but not seen or be seen but not really be there? Um, this print is called uh, Double Trouble and it's a, it's a silk screen, it's all silk screen. The stripes in the back are just um, hand taped and individually printed. And then the other image is, um, is a half tone. And that's 22 by 30. Um, these are further images from that series, from the Skin in the Game series. Um, these, are, these are not silk screens, these are digital prints. And they're um, 38 by 50. And they're also, um, so here I'm using, again, using the walnut ink. Um, and I, I was interested, well, I guess I'm gonna talk about that later, the walnut ink, but I, I'm interested no, in those you can do it now, you can do it now, it's fine. <laughs> um, I, I became interested in making um, my, own, my own walnut ink, and I can talk about how that happened later. Um, but as a material, I liked how it, I liked the warmth of it, which was something that I was thinking about, um, like I mentioned in that other drawing. And I also, you know, I, I, to me, it was just, it's just more talking about the body, right? Like it's, yeah, it's uh, a more organic. direct reference. Yeah. yeah, it's like a more direct reference to um, to the body and, you know, something being created. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing that I was trying in this, in this was I, um, began experimenting with tapestries and, um, in this, in this image, you can see I had, I had, um, a tapestry made actually of the dream flag drawing. That's what that is in the back. And so I was interested in, again, in this idea of reinvention, I was interested in what the translation would be from the drawing to this, to this thing. And I was also interested in um, developing a relationship with the textile and the, the drawing. Um, I think I wanted, um, I wanted to mediate something between the image and the wall. I wanted to soften it. I wanted to refer to something again that brings comfort, right? Like you could take that off the wall and like wrap it around you. Um, or it also, I think there is also like a very like body quality, right? Like the way that it's hanging like that is like, it's like a peep show or it's like, you know, the bottom of like breasts or something. Um, so I was also interested in bringing those kinds of associations, like a more intimate kind of association into the work. Um, this is more of the, so the, so the, this iteration of the Skin in the Game work had two names. Um, so one was absence, one, one was presence. And so this is part of the presence series. This is part of the absence series. Um, and I guess, again, that sort of refers to that idea of the um, invisibility and the hypervisibility. Um, there's another one. And again, these are 38 by 50 digital prints and um, with paper, on paper coated with walnut ink. How do you apply that ink? With a brush. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think this, um, I, I think I need to start talking faster. So the other series that sort of is evolving alongside the skin in the game is another series called Slogans for the Revolution That Never Was. And the slogans for the revolution are, it's always text-based work. Um, it's never, it never offers itself immediately as text. Um, you have to work for it just like you have to work for most things. Here's another drawing from that series. This is the drawing that was included in um, 
an exhibition I had in the Kentler last June. Um, the drawing is framed by a print that I made. It's so uh, this is, I do sometimes use multiples. Um, and here the multiple is being used to frame this drawing, which is, this drawing is 90 by 88. Um, and the, the images on the side are, it's an image of a, of a charm used by, I guess it's used many places in the world, but in the Caribbean, it's put on um, a newborn to ward off the evil eye. And it's sort of like a, a, a protection sort of symbol. And um, so this, I had a project where I made these prints of this sort of like a limitless edition. And I made these prints and I would just give them out to people all the time as a way to sort of like, as a way of thinking about like, casting this like big net of protection either over a neighborhood or over the city or you know so I think about it like as it goes out it can kind of like create more and more um of protection power and again this drawing has text um this is that same image sort of reused in a different way this is um I would say my first real sculpture. It's called Asavache, um, and it's um, silk screen on uh, on cotton. Uh, and again, it's sort of that evoking the domestic, sort of like like evoking the revolutionary and the domestic. And um, you know, I thought about this as like. A clothesline, like maybe you're drawing your clothes, but then it can also be removed. You grab poles and it can go out to the march, right? So it's sort of like dual purpose. You can take it out to the protest or you can dry your clothes on it. Um, this is a print, a silkscreen print made in 2019. Um, it was printed by a former uh, student, Noah Legal. Um, and it was um, combining, right? So thinking about combining the slogans and the image. So starting to put those things together. Um, this image is from an exhibition that I had at the Everson Museum. And there on the lower right, you can see another large drawing. That was the first really large drawing I made. Um, which was exhibited on the floor and uh, it also featured tapestries and these tapestries also sort of combined my figure with text. Um, although this time it's text that I, I generated. It's not borrowed text, it's my text. Um, and with these banners, I was trying to think about, again, a desire for social justice. You know, how do you, how does one generate desire for this? How does one de or generate desire for social change? Like, where does it reside, like, in your body? Like, um, like, what does that, you know, how, how strong can you make that desire? Um, so the first one, so you all can read them. Okay. Uh, and the last thing I want to talk about is my collaborative project, the Brooklyn High Art Machine that I started in 2010 with Oasa DuVernay, um, which, ha which takes place on our block in Brooklyn. Uh, we have both lived in the same building for over 20 years. And at some point we were just like, oh, we're both artists, we're both moms. We, you know, we both were teaching artists, like, let's do this. So, um, so the Brooklyn High Art Machine um, is a project that it just engages people on the street, our neighbors in making work. So here's an image of some of that. So this is after a silkscreen workshop that we held on the street. Um, we sort of commandeer this fence that's uh, across the street from our building and we use it as makeshift drawing rack, sometimes makeshift gallery, as you can see in this um, image. And um, all this is an image actually from, I don't know, quite a few years ago, maybe four or five years ago with a post that's run strike now, which is um, appropriate for our current moment. 
Uh, yes, so this well, is a lot what it of looks this like. Is... We bring up. <laughs> uh, so this is what it looks like. We bring out some sawhorses and a board uh, and some screens, and we um, invite people to make prints with us. So here's someone who's sort of watching for now, waiting, you know, seeing how it's done, and then she's going to print. So here it is. Um, some of the kids on the block have really been doing this for quite a while. It's sort of our hope that they'll take it over one day. Um, and uh, the kid in the back, like you can see his face, it's like, whoa. And like, that's one of the things about printmaking, like, right, like it has this magical quality where like you do something and then you see it and you're like, whoa. <laughs> so yeah. I think that's something that's really engaging um, yeah. for them. Well, um, and so this is what it looks like. We use um, Tyvek and we cut out letters or we have people cut out letters and then and you just sort of arrange your message on there and then we can print several times. Um, this was an adult who had this really ambitious message that she had put together and we were trying to get a good print of it. Um, the other part of the Brooklyn Heart Machine that's become really important has been these fence weavings that we do. And we typically do the fence weavings on our block on a bridge that um, sort of divides our block. Um, the image you see here, but then we also have been invited to do these fence weavings in other locations. So what you're seeing here is a fence weaving that we did at the Wyckoff Farmhouse, <clears throat> which is the oldest um, colonial house or Dutch house in Brooklyn. And we were invited to make a weaving for um, an exhibition they were having on immigration and immigrants in the community. And at, at this time, you know, most of the immigrants in that neighborhood are West Indian. Um, and in thinking about what we wanted to weave into there, we also wanted to think about the initial wave of immigration being the Dutch. And we also wanted to acknowledge the fact that it had been um, Lenape land before the Dutch arrived and before even the current immigrants arrived. And so how do you account for all these different waves you know, of immigration? So the weaving read stories tell of loss, each new land allows new dreams. And the first letter of each um, word uh, spelled out stolen land. Um, so you can see the pink cell spells out stolen land. And here is a weaving that we were invited to do at the Brooklyn Children's Museum. Um, and this was interesting um, because they actually bought a chain link fence for us. So it was very deluxe and, a, and quite a, a change from what we usually do, which is just work on the street, um, you know, in, in real time with people stopping and talking to us, which is really one of the great parts of the project is all the conversations that we get to have, which is really a lot of what I want to have happen with my studio work, but that when you're working on the street, it just happens um, much more organically and intimately than it does in a, in a gallery space. Yes. Well, um, and so I um, think this is- A few more um, slides, okay. <laughs> this is the last segue. just so you know what it looks like so he would, mm -hmm. just to end where i started we are still here beautiful i can end there <laughs> <laughs> well it's um a great segue to talking about your community work which you know we see a little bit of that here but it's a really huge part of your practice and um if you wouldn't mind it would be great it up. if you could elaborate on that a little of some of the other works you, you've done with um, students in the community um, in New York, you know, and other community projects you've done. Um, sure. So, you know, a lot of the, when I started the, oh, can I ask a question? Are, are we still sharing the screen or not? Uh, I don't think so. No, I don't. I, no, I don't see your screen. Okay. Um, so when um, 
before I, I worked for New York City Housing for a long time. And the New York City Housing used to have an art program that I think not many people know about called Harborview Art Center. And that program sent artists out to all NYCHA sponsored community centers um, working so and doing art workshops with seniors, teens, and kids. And I worked, that was when I first moved back to New York from the Midwest, that was my job. And it was a great job in lots of ways in that I grew up in New York City and then I left New York for eight years to get an education. And then when I came back um, to New York, it was really, it was a really good place for me to sort of re-enter New York where I had left because I grew up in public housing. And so it was really, um, I guess a good way to think about like what, what my journey had been. Um, you know, so I've been, so working in community, working with community, I guess has been a part of my practice for as long as I've been sort of like an adult artist. Um, and I think the Brooklyn High Art Machine was a way to, um, you know, to continue doing that, like in a less formalized way, in a less, in more a thinking of like, um, how do you make that into an art project, you know, as opposed to just providing service, which I think is often how it happens, right? How do you make it more collaborative? How do you make it more of a participatory thing as opposed to thinking about it as service, which I think is maybe some of the ways in which community arts is thought about sometimes. Yeah. Because, and one of the reasons I say that is because when we first started, people would come up to us and they'd be like, oh, what organization are you from? And be like, we're not from an organization. We live right there. We live across the street. <laughs> and the conversation completely changed, right? Like people's attitude completely changed. People would sit and talk. And it was a really, really different um, experience then because of that. And then additionally, you know, when you do community arts, you do public art, you get to do the art, you get to leave. We don't get to leave. <laughs> <laughs> we live here and so you know whatever we do we're sort of accountable in a different way um, right. than if it, it was you know than if it had a different structure yeah well I know when we first started discussing having you speak at MGC we you said well do you want me to talk about Bro Brooklyn High Art or do you want to talk me to talk about my own work. <laughs> I said, I can't choose. <laughs> you know, they're just both fascinating aspects of what you do. And I think they really tie together um, in this idea that um, revolution is active and dreaming is active. And you've talked a lot about how um, um, Kelly has influenced your work um, in thinking about the work of dreaming and hoping for a better future is almost as significant as the activism itself. Um, and I, we have some questions, I think, that would tie into that, um, that relate a little bit to a question that I prepared, but these are from the audience. So maybe we'll put it in their words. Um, we have a question um, from, uh, Two questions from Jennifer, uh, which kind of relate to each other. Can you see them on your uh, screen? Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, where, where do you start when there's so much happening in the world? Um, social justice, racism, health, and education. Where does your process begin before you create a work of art? So I think that relates to this idea of the dreaming and the thinking and activating people. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I guess, you know, and, and Sarah, you and I talked about this. I think, I think part of what's important to me is to like not be in crisis mode all the time. Right. And so I think with my right. work, I don't feel like I need to respond to everything that happens moment by moment. It's too much. Um, and so, you know, and that there are, I think, you know, within everything that happens on a day to day, there's broader themes that tie it together. And so I think I, I'm often thinking about like the broader themes, you know, so I, I'm thinking about, um, 
I, yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I'm, I'm not a response mode artist, um, but I, I'm, I, it's more about like the long haul and I'm trying to think about the long haul. So when I'm starting, I think I try to start from um, an intimate place, right? So like working from the inside out. Right. I don't know if that answers your question, um, Jennifer. So taking but. like personal responsibility for your role and these things. Um, or like, accountability, I would say, I mean, mm -hmm. more than responsibility, but yeah, you know, yeah. Um, we have a question um, from Andrew uh, that says, thank you for sharing your work apart from a uh, cultural, historical, and social concerns, your work evolves deep and profound beauty, evokes, excuse me, your work evokes deep and profound beauty. What kind of conversations do you and your artist peers have at the moment in our society where we lack beauty and humanity as with witness to racial injustice? I think this might tie in a little bit to the previous question. Uh, where does your art and printmaking in particular as a form of democratic dissemination for creative and artistic ideas come into play in the broader public culture of inclusion and ethnic pride? So I think maybe this was an earlier question and po possibly addressed by some of your community projects that we mentioned. Um, so uh, maybe you could speak a little more about the dissemination bit, which I think is part of why you enjoy printmaking. Sure. So I feel like I, yeah, so printmaking. So I think um, I'm interested in the history of printmaking. I'm interested in the history of printmaking as a medium of dissemination and as all, and like, um, and like the question says, like a democratic medium, right? That uh, it was, it was invented to be more acceptable. And I also like that it can exist in several places at the same time. I like that by creating a multiple, it implies that it's going to be in more than one place or it implies that you can share it. Um, and so I like all those things about it as sort of like the, the, the form itself kind of implies a, a desire to communicate, a desire to connect. Um, uh, and so those are the, some of the things that draw me to printmaking. Um, there was another, I sort of wanted to go back to uh, Robin Kelly and the moment and like how I think about the moment as an artist. And I guess one thing that I'm thinking about, so um, I think you're gonna ask about this, but I, you were gonna ask about like what my political involvement has been or what kinds of organizations I've been part of. And um, a lot of the organizations that I was part of weren't necessarily typical organizing um, uh, groups, but rather, you know, um, so one group that I was a part of was called Escuela Popular Norteña, which was a popular education school. And popular education sort of starts from the point that everyone has knowledge, right? Like everyone has, everyone has knowledge and how do we, how do we get together to generate knowledge and through the generation of that knowledge, like generate analysis to help our own condition. And in that as well, there's this idea of, um, in some of the groups that I've been part of, there's also this idea of like prefigurative politics. So that while you're fighting to create change, you're also fighting to create the thing you want to see once you, you know, so like, if capitalism were to fall right now, what would we have? How would we organize ourselves? How would we live? Like, how would we, how would you and I talk to each other, right? Like we don't have practice doing that, right? Because we exist in what the thing we exist. So how do we practice what that other thing would be like? What would it feel like? What would it, you know, how would it affect, how would it affect the way people relate to each other? Um, and so in thinking about Robin Kelly and the dreaming and this moment, something that I'm thinking about a lot and something that I'm really concerned with is like, you know, we're at a moment where, you know, capitalism has stopped kind of, right? Like it's like, there's been a break, like this severe break that's happened through um, this worldwide quarantine. And I'm really, 
interested and concerned with like what comes after this right like is this a moment that can be activated right like is this stoppage like an, a moment that can be activated and then what's the dream what's the role of like imagination and action and work in that in that you know in that kind of moment in that kind of rupture that we're experiencing that we're all living in right now right like what can be um generated and what can come out of the other side of that so i guess that's um that's a little bit where my artist imagination is right now is in thinking about that and not just thinking but in doing right like so i'm also like with my neighbors organizing a rent strike and if you know and also working towards rent forgiveness so like um you know if people you know, how do people who didn't lose their jobs, how can we be in solidarity with people who did lose their jobs and who won't be able to pay rent? You know, how can we um, stand together with them to avoid the mass evictions that we're going to have if nothing, you know, if nothing changes, if no intervention is made? So those kinds of things, I guess, are where I am right now as an artist. Yeah, one of the question, uh, yes, really, uh, Andrew's question was two part in the beginning was more about, you know, finding beauty in a sort of ugly situation. Uh, what, can you, and, and I also was interested in your use of stripes and these colors, and I don't know if it's related in any way, but uh, if you could address that. I mean, I do want my work to evoke joy. I mean, I, mm -hmm. that's important to me. And I think um, working for social justice, and I think that's joy, right? Like that to me is a joyful activity. Um, and so I think it is important for my work to be bright and colorful and energetic. Um, so I think that's the relationship. It's, you know, I, yeah. I mean, I, I also, I just like it. Like I like color um, stripes. I think stripes for me, I think stripes, the love of stripes, I think came out of a love of color, right? Stripes let you use lots of colors. But I also think there's something about stripes that um, for me, like the grid sort of imply infinity. Like when you're looking at a stripe, are you looking at the whole thing or is there a lot that came before it and a lot that goes after? So I think that's part of um, what I'm interested in with the stripes too, right? That there's a sense of something that's ongoing, um, which I think, you know, connects back to the dream worker wall, right? Like that there's an ongoingness to all of this um, and, you know, in a work, right? Like this sort of joyful ongoing work. Right. And that um, kind of relates back to Kelly as well. Um, maybe just we've been referencing the, the work and if you're not familiar with the, the book, it's uh, Freedom Dreams, the Black Radical Imagination and it was print, published in 2002. And it's really interesting. I just read it again briefly to kind of prepare. Um, but it's so interesting to read it again in this moment um, because he wrote this before um, many of the changes where, you know, the radical changes in the, of the last 18 years or so have happened, you know, and before Obama was elected and before, uh, so he's talking about dreaming and the act of dreaming and having a hopeful and joyful, um, like you say, uh, approach to imagining a new future and what, what does that future look like? Um, and I can see how much that, that idea weaves itself into all of your work. Um, and it takes all these different forms. Um, so to quote from him, and I think this is to the heart of some of the other questions that have come through tonight, you know, how do we produce a vision that enables us to see beyond our immediate ordeals? And that, that kind of struck me with the way you talk about how you don't want to get involved in every little news, not little, but news cycle that happens, like what's the big picture? Um, how do we transcend bitterness and citizen cynicism and embrace love, hope, and an all-encompassing dream of freedom, especially in these rough times? So I think we can all agree that times have gotten even significantly 
rougher since he wrote this book. Um, and I just wonder, you know, do you, you're still, you know, feeling this now, you know, how are we going to move forward? But I think you addressed that a little bit earlier when you talk about, well, what if capitalism, you know, collapses, what, how, maybe we should start doing that work. And we're already kind of starting to wade through it in, on an individual level and on an organizational level, uh, at least in my organization, you know, what does the future look like? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I guess part of it is like, how do you start to collectivize that, right? How do you start to bring in those little clusters that are working on it and, you know, to build something larger? Um, and I was also thinking, I mean, I don't, I don't want to give, you know, there's also grief in my work sometimes. It's not in the work I presented, but I guess I don't want to give the idea that I'm, that it's only optimism, right? Like they, I have made work where I, I had a whole series of works that I made where I was really, it was about sort of grieving um, the, all of the movements that erupted in the world around, you know, after the Arab Spring, right? There was like all the movements that erupted globally, all these like, um, these freedom movements really of people trying to live a different kind of liberatory um, existence, including, you know, in the US here with the Occupy movement in New York and how all of that was met with extreme violence from the state, you know, so I, so that has also, you know, been in my work and that kind of grief over um, when that work of dreaming you know, has been destroyed. Right. Well, uh, I think, you know, that's a good note to end on. We, we've covered a lot of philosophical issues in your work. We'll just give people a few more seconds to uh, answer any last questions as we address a few smaller questions um, here uh, that came up or comments. Um, one was the discussion of uh, work, some of your work you refer to as drawings and what does that term mean in this context? Yeah, I saw that question. Um, I guess, I guess I just, I, I don't, I don't think of myself as, I think of myself as someone who makes drawings. I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> I'm not sure. Like works, unique works on paper? Um, sure, yeah. <laughs> I, as a former museum curator who had to categorize everything, yeah. you know, if, if it was, uh, if, it would, if it had any handwork, it was of, of any sort, we would call it a drawing, you know, if it had any, you know, it was print, it might have a printed element, but if it had any handwork. Um, right. And so, uh, is that, I assume, what, what you mean by that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it means drawing versus painting or if it meant print versus drawing, but. Yeah, um, and a unique work on paper, uh, I guess. Um, and then uh, we have another comment um, about the Aboriginals. Uh, I know uh, the Australian ar ar Aboriginals who live in the dream of time and the dreaming. Is that um, something that you've thought about? Uh, I mean, it's not something no. I know very much about, but I definitely, <laughs> I'll look into it. Um, also, somewhat, uh, Dorothy said something about um, liking the what if, and I, I guess I just want to say, like, asking questions is really important to me in my work, um, or generating questions. I think I'm more interested in generating questions through my work than I am in coming up with answers or providing answers. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, I'm interested in sort of like that generating of, of the questions with my work. So thank yeah. you. I'm glad you said it's that. all about act, activating the viewer too. And I would encourage all of you to uh, explore Mildred's work further uh, online. She has a artist talk that she gave um, that addresses some of these issues we're talking about with the dreaming and the hoping of the future and the work of that as well for her exhibition at the, um, the Dreamwork exhibition. 
at the Burlington Arts, um, I'm probably not saying it correctly, Arts Center or Art, you can tell me what it is, the name of the uh, organization. And then, BCA. Uh, sorry? BCA, Burlington BC, City Arts. BC, Burlington City Arts. And also on her website, which is uh, the, uh, it's her name basically, dot com, yes. <laughs> And uh, I would like to thank you all for joining us this evening. And special thanks, of course, to Mildred uh, for sharing her time and thoughts and um, work with us. Uh, and Beltre will have an, uh, she'll be, her work will be included in an exhibition that's uh, upcoming at the Zuckerman Museum of Art at the Kennesaw State University in Georgia, which is titled Reimagining a Collection. And that will be on view from August 29th to December 6th. And uh, we'd like to invite you to uh, stay in touch with us online as well. We'll continue to deliver these online programs and uh, join our, web, our uh, mailing list if you are not already on it and look for future events like this and consider donating if it's within your means. We know many are financially stressed at the moment but we'd appreciate that if, you, if you're able to. Thank you for joining us. Hi, thanks.